with Kim on a whole different kind of level because I know the woman knows that of what she sings. She's not performing today. As she said in the illustration that she gave, that, that doctored pastor could say the Lord's, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, but the other person knew the Lord as his shepherd. And the evidence of her singing that song, or signing that song today is the evidence of one who knows that of what she was signing to us about. She's not lost her praise because of God has been faithful. Let's give Sister Kim another just show of appreciation. And thank, thank God for using her to enrich our time today. Wow. I think she was used of the Lord to take our already awesome worship experience to another level. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. And as we would continue with our worship by hearing the word of God and finding application for our lives, let's, let's take a moment to commit ourselves to each other. Heavenly Father, there are some among us who have not lost their praise, but there's others of us who need to find it again. We thank you that you have used this moment in the service to draw hearts and minds and attitudes back to you, complete worship, adoration, Thank you, Lord, that you give such perspective. And so we commit and submit ourselves, our hearts, our minds, our lives, to the altar. Pray, Lord, that we would hear from you now, that you would give us wisdom and instruction to know how we can turn our lives in such a way as to worship you by our life, by our life. To this end, we offer ourselves in Christ and submit ourselves to you. Boy, my, my heart is full. <laughs> my, my heart is full. I, I wish someone had prepared me for what was going to happen. Um, I, I, I'm just so grateful to the Lord right now. That's a powerful testimony he gave us. Brothers and sisters, as I began last week, God desires our best. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God desires your best? Friends, he's already given his best. He gave heaven's best. Can you imagine when the divine plan of God was revealed in the heavenly courts? When the angel, no, we, we, Elder Pete helped us last week by saying the, the angels have to stand with folded wings. They don't know what it is to experience the plan of salvation. They don't know what that is. They don't know what it is to be redeemed. And so when the songs of redemption are sung, you know, though their wings are always spread and glory to God, they got to put them down because they don't know what, they don't know the experience that we have. So you can imagine when the plan of God is revealed that the divine Son of God is going to go in, into the earth, take on human form, and live among them. Well, that sounds almost good. We've kind of seen him do that in the Old Testament quite a bit. But no, when they got to the plan of salvation, that Jesus Christ would become sin for us and be rejected of the people, beaten, despised, hung on a cross, to be a sin substitute for us. Oh, that. I, I, you can hear the, the, the silence take place in heaven. What? You see, God and the angels were recognizing that God was going to give his best to save a fallen humanity. That in the giving of God's best, a redeemed humanity would take place. Brothers and sisters, if heaven could give his best, I believe that we can give back to this one who has already given us more than we could possibly understand. And so I'm, I'm praying that by means of the word that we will hear today, that it would impact us in all that we do and say. Our theme for the coming year is know what you believe and know why you believe. You see, we live in an era and in an age that no longer just accepts the Word of God for what it is. They take the, the Word of God as optional. They take the Word of God as, eh, well, uh, let me get a second opinion on that. And so, in all that we're going to be doing this year, by means of the pulpit ministry, by means of the Wednesday evening service, by means of the Sunday school, the goal is to help you to know what you believe and why you 
must believe it. You see, there's no real change unless there's first heart change. And to get to the heart, for many people, you have to go through the brain. Many people are still halting between two opinions, the world's secularism and multiculturalism and, and, and um, humanism, and, and still kind of juggling the Word of God somewhere in that, and, and, and who knows on a given day what will prevail. But God would have us to know Him, believe Him, trust Him, so that, you know, when crisis comes, we don't lose our brain. They just hide all the while we are trusting. But that's to come in the in in the coming days and months. But today we want to conclude our theme: maximizing your work. How by doing it is unto the Lord. We have principals here. We have teachers here. We have students here. And the question, and of course, the, the regular congregation. And as we move from the summer months into a new school year, into a, back into the work world, and some of us are burned out, we need a vacation from our vacation, uh, uh, we, we, we need some impetus to get back into a new cycle of things. Don't you agree? Well, we need something that will help us to understand, well, what kind of posture can I take as I move into another season? As I began a couple of months, uh, weeks ago, we are all in some state of transition, and transitions need to be managed. You don't just go through, through transitions so-so. Transitions must be managed. A and we need to prepare for transitions so that they can be properly got through. And so as a part of that, as we move into the, the, a new cycle of work, a new cycle of, of schooling, the goal is to help you to have the best perspective. How can you maximize your school experience? How can you maximize your work experience? How can you maximize your ministry at Grace Community Church? How can you do that when you know things don't always go right? Uh, you, you can want to be the, the best Christian on the workplace possible, but you've got a lousy boss who just makes life difficult. You may want to be, be the best Christian wife in the world, but you know that, that husband is a difficult man. And so how do you get the right perspective to do what ought to be done. Well, trusting that by means of our time together today, you would have a perspective that would allow you to do whatever you do. Lord, God has given you a perspective. So, we begun by, with the understanding that God desires our best, the best of our time, the best of our abilities, the best of our energy, the best of our strength, the best of our creativity. He wants our best thinking, our, 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 our best caring, our best efforts. Because we were made, we were made for his glory. We were made to glorify him all that we do, think, and say. And so he wants our best. Every week, every week we hear uh, an instance of this when we give our offering. Honor the Lord with your wealth. With the first fruits. With the best with the first fruits of all your substance. The first fruits of all your substance. You know, sometimes as a pastor, I, I, I meet with someone and they're saying, boy, you know, pastor, big stuff, and, and do you really have to talk? And they make it sound unintentionally as though it's some requirement that the church puts on you. And, you know, everything in me wants to say, boy, you know, no man, you don't need to talk. You know, you want to help them out. But friends, this is not my word. I'm not the God who says he will stand behind his word. I'm not the God who makes these promises. He is. And God, the Bible says, without faith it is impossible to please him. For those who come to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I was waiting for somebody to say seek him. It is more than just seeking him. There's a diligence to it. There's a belief that he's real and that he, he rewards those who diligently seek him. Note the first thing I said. Without faith, it is unlikely, impossible to please him. And so, friends, God, God hits us right where our religion is most real. In your pocket. God says, let me see how much you're willing to trust me where you know 
is the one area you are trusting in something other than God. Your ability to pay out of what you have and what you can see. And God says, honor me with the first fruits of all your son. And I explained to you last week what first, the first fruits principle. There's a lot of discussion about this. A lot of people, we, we've seen some churches in their zeal try to hawk money out of you by maybe just running on with seed and this, that, and the other. Well, I'm not going there. The principle of the first fruits is sometimes before the harvest arrives, there's a whole crop of fruit that appears before. And farmers, we're not really from a farming culture where we understand these things. But, and that first fruits was an, was an evidence, almost a, 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 a preview of what was to come later, maybe in a couple of weeks. And, and for God to say, give the first fruits, and you only see nothing beyond that first fruits, that could kind of take your nerve. Anyone out there with me? But see, the first fruits is the evidence that you're trusting God. Because guess what, folks? You didn't even have to get that first fruit. I wish someone was hearing me. You see, that first fruits is the evidence of blessing. This is before the harvest. You get this before the harvest. So why are you acting like this yours? And so the first fruits principle kind of helps us to understand Will we trust God in the midst of what the devil makes a temptation for us? Boy, you know, you need that, you know, you need that. You need that. Don't, don't fool with that now. Lie them, lie to Allah, fight on him. He, he don't need that. Folks, it ain't for me. It, it's the Lord's. I have, I have a standard salary. I'm not one of these fellows with jets and planes. You know, whenever I go on the show, uh, on these radio shows, they try to hit you with that. Hey, 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 you all pastors? I say, boss, listen, I have this kind of car. Don't go there with me. I don't drive Bentley. I don't have a plane. I don't have a helicopter. Don't go there with me. You can come see it. In fact, it's right outside the parking lot. You will come see it. You're free to. I will say that. I haven't said that last bit, but I really want to say that. Unfortunately, there are bad examples of people miss the fact that the money is the, ch the, the tithe is not the pastor's money. This church will tell you, I don't sign no check. I don't sign no check. The name is not a signatory. So it's not about Lyle Bethel. It's about building the kingdom. We are, you can see, thank you very much. You can see as a member of Grace Community Church, the budget. Uh, you're going to be getting that budget in a couple of days. You can see where everything goes. We are a transparent church. Uh, we are a church that does not hide from its members that which they need to make an informed, intelligent choice on. Let's take a quick segue from there just to say this. Folks, Grace Community Church wants to be a church where you can come with your family, where you can feel at home where you're going to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to be challenged to worship him deeper than that. And, you know, because we want you to have that experience, we have three sets of bathrooms where you can come because, you know, nature calls, right? We offer Sunday school classes, not just for the adults, but for children that are age appropriate to them. We have lots of parking space for you. And then we, we went even further than that. We figured, you know what? Since we know the nature of the beast that we're dealing with, and people say, well, you know, I, I don't know if I will come out a little early. I've got to cook breakfast for children them. And we say, you know what? We can have breakfast ready for you. And some said, well, you know, I don't eat corned beef and grits. So we got that taken care of. we got some fruits for you, too. And so, because, I'm sorry, and Johnny Cake, yes. Yeah, so we obviously someone over there loved Johnny Cake. All right, okay. And so, because we, as a church, understand we're, we're, we're trying to bring families in. And we're trying to get people to understand, listen, here's where you can come to a safe place, learn about Jesus, practice your faith among other believers, and learn how you can take that faith and export it into your workplace. We want to make sure you can hear the word of God in comfort. We got you an air-conditioned comfort, um, nice seats, all kind of nice aesthetics. Got one of this wonderful praise team and Musicians who can do all of these things. Why? Why? Why do we go through the effort? Why? Because we recognize that people, you know, I, I told a, someone from another church the other day, I said, listen, just starting off with this. You don't have a place for people to park their car. This is now a driving society. This ain't 40 years ago where maybe one person and 10 out of car. If you don't have a parking lot, a nice clean bathroom for your people that come to when they come to your church, trust me, all the good preaching in the world ain't going to help you. Because there comes a time when people will say, you know what? I like it. I like the church. But you know, I never have no place to park. I come late. I am my clothes and tight and a heart of sweat by the time I get to the church. 
that, 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 that ceiling fan ain't doing nothing for me. And so, by the grace of God, we've been enabled to be a kind of a church that can put an emphasis into these things to bring you to a place where you can learn about the Lord and help them. And where your squirming child next to you doesn't have to be squirming next to you because there's a nursery for that child. A nursery that's properly staffed. A nursery that's cleaned every week. A nursery for babies and toddlers. It's all there. It's right there for you. And you know, um, we recognize that some families have intention. You know, if one parent drop off a child, that parent got to go pick up the child. We don't want to fight this. Someone appeared out of nowhere, pick up the child, didn't have the authority. Listen, there's all kind of craziness going on in the world, but we're trying to have a safe place where you can learn about the Lord here. And because we have an aging population, the reason we've not been able to have that reception for you is we have been creating an absolute, aesthetically beautiful, pleasing fellowship hall to take it from upstairs and brought it downstairs. Because we know that our aging population can't make those stairs anymore. And we're doing all of these things because we want to be a church that is comfortable for you, where you can learn about the Lord, where you can have an opportunity to challenge so that you can practice. We want you, if you are a member of Grace Community Church, we want you to take full advantage of all that we're doing. That means we expect to see you on Wednesday evening. We expect you to be a part of the Christian Education Hour where you can learn together. Um, we, we, we know that some of you are on rotation, but when you're not rotating, make sure you're in the class. We've got some stuff that's going to help you, particularly with that theme. Know what you believe and know why you believe. We want as full of participation as possible. And so, to God be the glory, he has enabled us to be a church that wants to be relevant, a church that wants to meet you where you're at, and a church that will cater to every aspect of who you are as a family. So we've got men's ministry, women's ministry. Hey, you might even be hearing impaired. We've got a ministry for that. We've got people who are staff who, who are dedicated to that ministry. And so we say all these things to help you. Perhaps you're visiting with us today. Uh, we want you to know as you're visiting, perhaps you're checking out a number of churches. We want to make ourselves available to you and your family. So we decide this is a place where we grow in grace. We'd love to have grace. Would you agree with me? All right. Our main text today <clears throat> is taken from Colossians 3.23. And this is kind of where we ended last time, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna focus on it as much now because the rest of the presentation will deal with that. But here's what it says. Should we read it together? But whatever you do, right? But what by the way, what do you think that would include? Everything, right? The way you do your marriage, the way you conduct yourself as a student. The, the way you drive on the roads, uh, the way you pay your customs duties when you come in, hard cut. The way you respond to others, but whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for man. Underline that, as to the Lord rather than for man. That's a huge thing there knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Circle that. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Brothers and sisters, we sometimes get lost on what the perspective of our lives should be. We get lost. And I've got a couple of scriptures here that can help us to understand what it's really all about. If we have the attitude that everything we do is to be done unto the Lord, it's for the Lord, it's, it's to give the Lord his glory. And even though we are, we're not rewarded now, we know that he will reward us later. We know that God has got our back. And so this is a key text. And in fact, you want to commit it to memory. So here's God's instructions for us as employees, whether that employs, I thought, should I change it this week? Whether that means you're a student, an employee, whatever you are where you're working under somebody else, here's what the Bible would say about how you should respond to them. By the way, anyone else no notice the enthusiasm of Teresa Williams and being this being a first? This woman, this woman has transitioned from being uh, a big shot at a bank to being a teacher. 
She's going up, friends. She's impacting our students, and boy, is she excited. She is absolutely excited. Love that enthusiasm. Can't beat it. Big shot teacher. Oh, sorry, Freddie. I should throw big shot teacher on there. That's the lot. Hey. She didn't want to just impact the financial community. She wants to impact the world. My Lord. Amen, Pastor Hannah. She wants to impact the world. How? By influencing the children that God gives her. And that, that, that window of opportunity she has, she's going to part. I, can, I tell you, I know Sister Teresa. She ain't going to just tell them what their lessons are. She's going to impart the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I know that the, that, that the teachers and principals we have here are of the same stripe. God be the glory. All right, some instructions for our students, uh, teachers, employees of every kind. We are told to be obedient to our employers. You know, you can't ever have two captains of a ship trying to run the ship. You can't have two presidents of the United States. You can't have two prime ministers. You need one person running things. And in every institution, the person who's running it needs support. That doesn't mean they can't get constructive help and, and criticism that is properly given. But because it can only be one, God calls us to line up our support under those who are above us. So we're told to be obedient to our employers. Where am I getting that from? Of course, Paul is writing in an age where uh, believers found that they were slaves. We're not, we don't really have that, certainly not in the Western Hemisphere uh, so much. Uh, and so the slave is not necessarily in our vocabulary. But, but think for our purposes, let, let's take the, the, the spiritualizer to understand those who are employees. Uh, slaves slash employees in all things obey those who are your masters on earth. We are to respect and obey even bosses who are unfair and unpleasant. Someone says, how could you, how could you respect someone who's unfair and unpleasant? No. Jesus says, do it to others, you have them do it to you. Jesus says, uh, treat them the way you would treat the Lord. Treat them with respect. Not because they deserve it, but because you are a called man or woman of the Lord Jesus Christ. You live by a different standard, and you are you are understanding. I am, I am, I am serving this person as unto the Lord. I will treat them with the dignity and respect I would give to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's how I carry that, deserving or not, deserving or not. I'll tell you, it'll transform the vast majority of businesses and schools in the country. Because chances are we get locked into a personality clash with somebody and the attitude is, hmm? <laughs> Talk to me like that? They, 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 they. What they don't hear, they can feel. What they don't, what was the expression? What they don't hear, they can feel? And so we, good old Christians, I can lay my, I can lay my religion down on them. You got me? But no, we're not called. The, the, the non-Christian can, can act like that, not us. We're called with a different calling, with a different standard. We represent Christ in everything we do. There ain't no laying down your religion for nobody. You serve them as though you are serving the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are doing it to the praise of his glory, and not your own. 1 Peter 2, 18 backs this up. It says, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. You see, Paul is a realist. Paul recognizes that you're not going to have the most perfect boss. Sometimes the boss is unreasonable. And God says, still, show them respect, show them support. Show them respect, show them support. He says in another place, 1 Timothy 6.2, we're also to respect and obey Christian bosses. Uh, and those who are believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. He also says, be hard working and trustworthy. Can you say that your work for your employees, for your employers, that you are a trustworthy person? Can you say that? If you are, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, friends, that ought to be on your resume. That ought to be right up the top of your resume. Trustworthy. 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 I'm sure when uh, Sister Mel Melody is looking for 
a new person at, at Genesis Academy or Sister Cassandra or Sister Christine or, or, or um, Sister Chantel um, and Sister Russell, when they're looking for persons for their schools, they want to know they're trustworthy. You, you think if they had knew for an instant that you're unreliable, you're going to get hired? You hire anybody who is unreliable? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. How about if they lie? How about if they steal time from you? Absolutely not. And the Christian is called to be reliable in all things. Absolutely reliable. They are the epitome. They represent Jesus Christ on earth. In all that they do, they represent Jesus Christ on earth. Anyone could see, without them saying a word, he was a Christian age. And how are they able to be that way? Why? Because they are serving their employer as though they're serving the Lord Jesus Christ. They're giving that employer everything. Excellence, right attitude. They don't answer tit for tat, butter for fat, because you know what? I'm serving the Lord. I'm doing this as unto the Lord, not as unto this boss, but unto the Lord. And they can get past the personality and the issues that come up in all employment. They're able to do that. They're hardworking and trustworthy. Colossians 3.22 says, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart. They're not, they're not trying to please the man. They're trying to please the Lord with a sincerity of heart. I like even better how the NIV puts this passage. It says, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor. How many of y'all still know what curry favor means? You know what curry favor means? You all know what curry favor, favor means? Come on, adults, what curry favor means? Come on, come on, let me see your hands. You, you, cause that, that's, that's out of fashion now. They don't really say curry favor no more, right? Favoring one person over another. Exactly. But we're told that we should not do our work just when their eye is on us. Well, I know they're doing teaching evaluation now, so let me go over and beyond. No, friends, the Lord watch him. Your employer, who, who are they? The Lord is watching. And so we do our work as unto the Lord. As unto the Lord. And friends, when you do your work as unto the Lord, they can watch as much as they like. They only can come with one conclusion. Well, I'll be. That's a good employee, eh? Employee, eh? Why? Because we're not waiting to be noticed. We're doing it as unto the Lord. And the Lord is pleased with that. We're also told to give our best while not complaining. Ah, the greatest of Christian sins. Complaining. Complaining, complaining, complaining. Oh, we know how to complain. See, we can't row. We can't carry on. We can't fuss and we can't cuss. Every, what Christian here believe you could cuss? Not a one of y'all, right? You, you, <laughs> I started like to throw me right off. You know we're not called to cuss. We're called to be... Let everything you do in word, thought, speech, and so forth be pleasing unto the Lord, right? But here it is now. We believe we could complain. Oh, I wish I had someone who was listening to me today. Listen, Christians have taken complaining to the next level. Which, indeed, is a reflection of their disbelief. Listen. Anyone could complain. It takes skill, wisdom, to know how to encourage in a way that gets the same thing across. You see, because I can tell you, most of you are going through lives where plenty of people are throwing something on you, and you're not good enough for this, you're not good enough for that. More people respond to compliments than to complaints. More people open up like a flower than they do to a harsh word. And so let us become those who know how to bring out what is good and virtuous and best. And let's leave the complaining to those who don't have God. Who, who don't see this other person as having value and worth. Who, who, 
who can't take the time to figure out, okay, this person might be having a hard life. How can I say this in a way that brings out what's best? Friends, I'm telling you, the Bible says, let us consider how we may stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Not beat up, not humiliate, not, 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 not frustrate, but stimulate. We work better with encouragement. Let us encourage each other, and all the more, more as we see the evil day approaching. Set, let's set aside the complaining. Let's work together on the encouraging. We're told in Titus 2.9, urge bond slaves to be subject to their own masters and everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative. Not argumentative. Can you find another way to do that without being argumentative? Three, be mindful of who your true boss is. Colossians 3.23-24 says, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. He's your true boss. Friend, I tell you, if you, if you latch onto this perspective, Life, well, the, the frustrations are going to begin dropping away. Because trying to please unreasonable men no longer becomes a focus. Trying to please a God who you know how he can be pleased becomes your focus. And unreasonable men and women that may be your bosses, they begin to see your inestimable worth to their company, to their school, to their employer. But it happen because we recognize the true boss is Jesus Christ. That's who we're serving. That's who we're serving. I said to you a couple of weeks ago, every pastor runs a risk of looking for the applause of men. And they believe that they are there to win the approval of the congregation. That's a deadly temptation. Thank God I was told in seminary to watch out for that before I ever began to preach or become a pastor. I was always mindful of that, always alert to that. Remember very carefully a, 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 a one of my professors saying, listen, preach as though you're trying to please Jesus sitting right there. So that's the only one you need to please. Because some can like, some can like you because they like your style. Some ain't going to like you. You march their corn too much. Some don't, you, you, some, they remind you of somebody else. I mean, you always, there's always some reason why someone can find a reason not to like you. Preach too long. Preach too short. Don't do this. Don't do that. Friends, you could get locked into a cycle where you're trying to please an, in, an innumerable, nameless, faceless crowd. Or you could say, Lord Jesus, I'm here to be faithful to you. Got it? And so, uh, that's the pastor's temptation. What about your temptation? Begin to recognize that trying to please a nameless, faceless crowd is near impossible. But when you make your focus, I will please Jesus with everything I do. Ah. That's focus. That's focus that's achievable. That's focus that's manageable. That can be done. Uh, you know, this word heartily there literally means from the soul. Please the Lord from the soul. Whatever you do, do it from your soul in such a way as to please him. Remember, the greatest, the greatest commandment that the, the, the Jews had that they recited every day was Shema Yisrael. Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. Of course, you know, it goes on to say, having been so stamped by these things, now you can stamp them on your children. You see, the real work is done when we, when we are convinced and we love the Lord from our soul. And we're trying to please him in all that we do and say. That's the real work right there. Heartily. And whatever you do tells that there's dignity in all work if it is done in a way that pleases the Lord. I believe this so strongly that I encourage the janitor with these things. I say, boy, I see you serve the Lord very well. This is great work. Uh-huh. What? What? What do you mean? It's clear that the work that you're doing, you're doing it unto the Lord because this is just excellent work. Click. Made a connection, didn't I? Maybe they just thought this was, uh, maybe they just have a, they like to work hard. But I'm, I'm trying to connect, I, I'm always trying to connect your reality to the bigger reality of God. And you've helped someone understand my janitorial work is serving the Lord, done 
for the Lord in his name, for his glory. I'm serving the Lord. I'm worshiping the Lord. He's pleased with us. He's pleased with us. Fourthly, be aware of our potential as witnesses. Titus 2, 9 to 10 says, Urge bond slaves to be subject to their own masters and everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, not showing, but showing all good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. Friends, what this means is what you do is a witness for Christ. We hear it all the time, particularly on the radio. And he's Christian. What does that mean? What does that mean? He doesn't represent what he says. That is the biggest trump card that people pull out of their pocket. And you say you's Christian? What do they mean? You ain't represent Christian with a baby, I see. And friends, when, the de when God has to use a non-Christian, he had to use Balaam's donkey to show Balaam how wretched his behavior was. Man had purchased the mouth of the prophet of God. Man had given the prophet of God who spoke truth and saw God work through his words and through his prophecies. He actually saw this. Such was his relationship with God. And he let man by his voice. He let man buy his soul. They told Balaam, listen, all of this gold and silver and cloaks, oh, it's all yours. Just curse Israel for us. Balaam bought. Friend, that's my biggest struggle with uh, some, some persons I see. Their voice has been purchased by gambling money. You need to be careful, man. Don't let your soul get purchased because you think you need it. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart is the admonition of Scripture. So be aware of your witness. The excellence of our work reflects on Jesus. Listen to what it says. So that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. What we do reflects on the Lord Jesus Christ. What we do points to or distracts from the Lord Jesus Christ. Believers, make sure your witness is a sound witness for the Lord. In all that you do and say, Another translation puts it this way, that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. Does your life make Christianity attractive to those who are around you? Does it? I believe that wherever Christians find themselves, others in the workplace are drawn to them. What is it about you? What is it about you? There's something different about you, and I like it. What is it about you? You see, friends, don't let no one recognize you as a Christian by the big Bible under your arm. Because I've seen some wretched sinners with the biggest of Bibles under their arms who have given the reputation of the Lord Jesus Christ the worst sort of reputation. Friends, let your heart reflect and trust in Jesus Christ. Why do I say that? Because our workplace is our ministry, our pulpit. Your workplace is your ministry, your pulpit. You've heard me say this before. There are 4,000 plus churches in this country. I believe there should be 2,000. There are some pastors could not, could not wait, felt that, you know, they're not, they're not real, they're not using their gift unless they're pastoring. And you know what they've done? They've weakened the church. Because uh, the church they left needed some stronger men there with them. And they've taken a whole host of, uh, of godly sisters with them when they left. And so a church is weak and not strengthened. They weren't sent off in the right way because the church said, listen, we've gotten too big now. We've got trained men and women here. We can, we, can, we can start another work somewhere else. No, it didn't happen like that. Someone didn't recognize that their strength was needed to keep this, this church going. And you know what? Some people believe that the only place they can have a ministry is right here behind this podium. And I say, what foolishness? What foolishness? What absolute foolishness? Sometimes I tell the Lord, Lord, I feel like I was more effective per person when I was in the work world than I've been as a pastor. And I just feel too spread out as a pastor. But I was able to have one-on-one -on -one time with my co-workers and see them led to faith. I always enjoyed that. I row with the Lord when he was telling me I was moving into ministry. Because I, I just, I somehow felt I was going to lose my faith. Now, mind you, I have, I'm effective on a whole heap of other areas. But that, that one that is so uniquely me, that one-on-one, -on -one, uh, in the workplace where I could sneak up on you. You don't know I'm a pastor. You don't even know I'm a Christian. 
and, until, you know, we've had those talks and, and I've been able to, because you didn't have any expectation, uh, I've able to, been able to, to use by God to win you to the Lord. I tell my Bob all the time, when I'm in this barber shop, don't you call me Rev, don't you call me Pastor. Because I want to hear the fellows talking. Where, what street are they living on? What, what are they thinking? How are they, whatever. And inevitably, conversation going on, Pastor, what do you think? Who, who's Pastor? Who's, are you Pastor? Conversation change. I said to my barber publicly, you wrong for that, you know. Watch these fellows' conversation change on me right now. You see, because there's, there's a beauty about, you see, light stands out in darkness. Light don't stand out with light. If I light a candle now, it's unimpressive. Let it be pitch black in here. Now the candle has effectiveness. And I believe that we need to recognize that our pulpit, our podium is the world, where they can see our faith in action, being exercised. And so, please reconsider this business of yours that perhaps if you're not in some ministry with the church, you're not in ministry. Marcus is a minister in his car company. You're a minister in the bank. You're a minister as a teacher. Use it. Use it. Whatever you do, do your work hardly as for the Lord. I like how 1 Corinthians 15, 58 puts it. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I would encourage you, church, to abound in the things of God. Okay, let's get through this. My time is just about gone. Five, we are to be confident of our eventual promotion. It's hard to do things when you know that there's no promotion coming. But friends, there is a promotion coming. There is a promotion coming. The story is told of a missionary couple coming back from the mission field forever. They'd been serving in Africa for 45 years. They'd hardly seen any converts. They'd established schools and, and a hospital and other things. And here it is. They're traveling back on uh, one of those big, big old boats coming back from Africa. And, and you know, um, it turns out that Teddy Roosevelt, the president, was on the boat as well. And he'd just been on a safari. And as they came off the, the boat, there was a ticker tape parade. There were just hundreds, there were tens of thousands of people out there to meet Teddy Roosevelt. And the, 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 the uh, the, the missionary, the, 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 the man, he just, he's just overcome. He says, God, he says, honey, there is just something wrong with this. We have served the Lord 45 years on the mission field. 45 years. This man has been the president of the United States for a couple of years. What has he done? His work has no eternal significance and value. And look at this. Look at the applause. Look at this. He comes home off of a safari. And look at this. There's a ticker tape parade for him. You can't number the people who are here to see him. His wife said, his wife had said, oh my gosh, my husband's in trouble. She taps on the shoulder and says, honey, honey, get home, give you some time, go to the Lord, take your issue. You know that little song, have a little talk with Jesus, tell him all about your struggle. My pastor did that. Uh, an hour or so later, his wife sees him coming out, come out of his prayer room whistling. You know, she's like, what, honey, what happened? What happened? He says, well, I was in the Lord. I was there with the Lord, talking and pouring my heart out. Just how wrong this was. This man comes home off of a simple safari, and there's all these che cheering and thunderous applause for, for, for hours. Ticker tape parade, motorcade, all of that. And you know, I says, Lord, it's just, it's, it's just crazy. And he said he felt the Lord come into that moment and say to him, Son. You're not home. You're not home yet. You're not home yet. You're not home yet. If you think Teddy Roosevelt gets this kind of applause for being the president of the United States who goes on a trip to Africa on a shooting safari and he gets this, imagine my son when you return home to me and you hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You're not home yet. You're not home yet. My Bible tells me, I has not seen nor ear heard the things God has for them who have served him faithfully in this earth. Friends, listen. You can live for the applause and the praise of men now, or you can live 
for the applause and praise of God. Always. Knowing that your reward is past understanding. For Paul says, I warrant that our light and momentary affliction is gaining for us an eternal weight in glory. Friends, I tell you, get the right perspective. This ain't about us. Jesus took little glory while he was on this earth. But my Bible tells me that there's coming a day when every knee will bow and on earth, under the earth, and in the sea, and everyone will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I looked and I saw a number that no one could count, and they were all giving praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah, there was a few. There was about maybe 800, 1,000 people saying, crucify him, we have no king but Caesar. Yeah, in those days. Friends, everyone else is singing a different song. Don't live for the approval and the praise of men. Live always for the approval and the praise of God. You'll have the right perspective in this life, and you'll know what your reward is. In the next. Friends, our paychecks are not our whole salary. From the Lord, you will receive the reward of your inheritance. God knows what you're doing, and He will reward us. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you openly. Don't get lost, friends. Don't misunderstand what it's all about. But a word now as we close for those who are employers. Your employers. If you are believers, God has a call on your life, and that is this. Treat your employees fair. Even in the slave master culture of Paul's time, Paul told the uh, believers quite candidly, grant your slaves justice and fairness. And justice and fairness. You are an employer. Treat that person as though God, you would want God to be watching over you and treating you. Do you want God to treat you unjustly the way you're about to treat them? Do you want God to make a note of how unfairly you treated them and, and, and treat you in the same way? No, believer. So let's uh, get our act together with this. They're also told, keeping our focus on our goal, that is to bring glory to God. Whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. We are also to pay our employees an honest wage. Employers, treat your employees with an honest wage. With an honest wage. A good pastor, a friend of mine, told me he went to preach to a church. Preach, preach his heart out for two weeks, man. Two weeks. Two weeks, he figured, boy, you know, I know this church can give me a little something I could go home, back home to my wife with. They gave him a bag of cassava. Now, I don't know how much gas you can buy with a bag of cassava. I don't know how much school fees you can pay with a bag of cassava. But friends, come on now. Let's make sure the person receives an honest wage. The Lord is watching. And also, never abusing our positions, authority, and power. It says, Master, do the same things to them and give up threatening. And just once again, remember who our real boss is, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. And so, as I bring the message to a close, I like the words of Horace Greeley, a great statesman in the, uh, during the years of the Civil War in the United States. He says, fame is a vapor, popularity an accident, riches take wings, those who cheer today may curse tomorrow. Only one thing endures, character. Let us remember that God has called us to represent Christ. Our character belongs to him. The musician is going to uh, play for just a moment. I'm going to return home and bring this home to us with a word of prayer for us. Thank you.
If you recognize that you're standing in the need of prayer today, that God has spoken to you by means of this word, just, just go ahead and put your hand up. We don't have time to have you all come to the front. But you recognize the Lord's been talking to you, and, and, and you, you want the Lord to know, Lord, I mean business. Uh, the pastor spoke to me today. He didn't know it, but, but you, you spoke to me through him, and, and I, I'm responding, Lord. I'm, I'm saying, yes, I'm changing my attitude and my posture, and my life is to be lived to the praise of your glory. See those hands. Let's go to prayer, shall we? Behold, Lord, you who have been the unseen uh, guest here at the church, look around and see those who are recognizing their need for a new perspective, a new understanding, a new appreciation on how work is done, uh, work that is done for you to the praise of your glory. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen their resolve, strengthen their hearts, strengthen, Lord, their conviction to serve you in every aspect. And Lord, as they make that decision now in their hearts to respond to perhaps even an unreasonable boss as though they're doing it for you, I pray, Lord, that you'd give them the, the unction, the, uh, the will, the wherewithal to serve their bosses as though they're serving you and do it to the praise and glo glory of your name. Give them strength, keep them in the right perspective, in the right mind, recognizing that they're not home yet. The rewards may not be evident now, but they are uh, uh, producing for themselves an eternal weight and glory by means of their righteous attitude in the way that they conduct themselves. Be with the various bosses whose hands are raised. Help them, Lord, to have a newfound appreciation for how they would minister to those who you've given them as their charges and over whose lives they exercise such authority. To this end, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, our service is over. Your service to the Lord remains. Go and serve him. And as we continue to build, uh, moving into this new year of service, give it all to the Lord in a way that pleases him. Amen and amen. Don't forget to greet the newlyweds who have returned to be with us today. And uh, go and serve the Lord.